is Tell Me What to Read, powered by Booktopia. I'm Jessie Stevens, an executive editor at Mamma Mia and the co-host of the podcast Mamma Mia Out Loud. And a best-selling author and in your own right. I have written a book. It is called Heartsick. Um, it is three stories about love and loss and what happens in between. And on the topics of books, it is one of my favourite things to talk about. And I am delighted to be joined by Holly Wainwright who is a writer, an editor, a broadcaster. She's head of content at Mamma Mia. And we will be discussing her fourth novel, The Couple Upstairs. Welcome, Holly. Thank you, Jessie. It's fun to take over this podcast, isn't it? Normally we're on Out Loud, which is three times a week, what women are talking about, but we don't always get to just talk about books. No, I can't believe they let us do this. (laughs) This is very interesting It's like we've snuck in and just like taken over. Anyway, thank you, Booktopia. So I want to begin with you providing a little bit of a synopsis of the book. For full transparency, I have read it. I absolutely loved every second of it. It is plotty and suspenseful and really nuanced. There are going to be massive conversations that come out of this. It's going to be the book everyone's talking about this summer, I reckon. Um, But I'm going to not do, a you know, I'm not going to do it justice in terms of providing a synopsis. So people who haven't read the book yet, What's it about? So The Couple Upstairs is about a woman called Mel who's living in an apartment block in Sydney near the beach and she becomes obsessed with the man who moves in upstairs from her. Specifically, he reminds her with an eerie level of intensity of a past love of hers. And then when his girlfriend, this young travelling woman called Laurie, moves in with him, the obsession grows deeper and their lives blur together And all kinds of weird things happen. I have a theory that every book, especially, I suppose nonfiction as well, but fiction, every fiction book starts with a question that you want an answer to. And then you set out to write this book to sort of clarify your own thoughts about something. What was the question that started this project? For me, it was very much about relationships, which are the things I like to write about the most, right? Whether they're romantic ones or familial ones or friendship ones. Like, I love writing about relationships. This specifically is about the line between romantic, passionate love and an abusive relationship. When When does a relationship become toxic to use a word we've been Mm. discussing a lot in the zeitgeist lately um and also are all our experiences of infatuation obsession lust are they all necessarily negative and I wanted to explore it from different perspectives from a woman who is sort of in her early 40s well she's 40 and she is just out of a a long marriage and thinking a lot about past loves which is what women do all the time right is that when things aren't going that swimmingly for them in their relationships they examine the ones from their past and that's what happens to Mel who's the the woman who lives downstairs is this young man who moves in he triggers for her this past love, that this love affair that was definitive in her life but ended badly and, and actually ended in tragedy in the end. And she wants to re-examine her choices from then on through that lens. But also the woman who's moved in upstairs, she sees the same thing happening to her. And should you step in? You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. should you step in when you can see a familiar pattern playing out or does everybody have to learn their lessons for themselves? Sorry, that was about three questions. No. <laughs> well, that's what happens. I think you start with one and then it almost gets more complicated. And what I realised about this book about halfway through was I have never, and I read a lot of books, I have never read a book about coercive control. And mm. coercive control is a new ish term for something that women will recognize all throughout their lives it's it's been happening forever but it's something that is very much discussed and very present at the moment what made you want to write about coercive control what was it about that 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 you wanted to explore because it's bloody complicated it's very complicated and I think in some ways I've shied away from saying the book is about coercive control because I worry that it sounds a little bit zeitgeisty and very I think people are confused by it mm-hmm. and what it means. and so they, they're like, is that a crime? Is yeah. that not a crime? And I think that, so Mel and Laurie 
both have experiences of this that they wouldn't necessarily, certainly while they were in it, call it that. But that time when you're so obsessed with somebody, you're so infatuated by them and they bring you lots of positive self-esteem messages in that them choosing you makes you feel powerful and in control and empowered and sexy and all these things. But then it begins to turn because in order to please them and stay in that light that they're shining on you, you have to change yourself. And how much of that is coming from you and how much of that is coming from them? And both Laurie and Mel, but 20 years apart, experienced this this sort of um, controlling man who makes them feel like the most important person in the world and also the tiniest piece of shit on the bottom of their shoe Mm. within five minutes and I think there are a lot of women who've been in those relationships don't you have you been in a relationship like that absolutely absolutely and there were these examples that that you had that I just went took my breath away with the specificity but also something that again you wouldn't frame as a crime when you write a book sometimes you um and I especially imagine it with fiction, you almost want to knock the reader over the head with this character is bad and this character is good. This book doesn't do that. It's a a comment that's made that just, there's there's one and I won't give it away, but um, they are at a concert and they're standing next to each other. And there is a comment that um, the man makes to Mel, and this is in kind of a flashback, that I just went, oh, my God, I know that feeling. Yes. Of just having someone... The sole purpose of what they've said is to embarrass you, to undermine you, and it becomes normal so, so quickly. And until you're in a relationship where that does not happen, you don't realise that that's not acceptable. That's not how people should behave. And for anyone who doesn't know what coercive control is, because it is a pretty new term, um, it's sort of on the spectrum of uh, when you talk about um, intimate partner violence. And on one end you have, we can point to it, that's a crime serious domestic violence issue exactly right then on the other end you have more subtle controlling behaviors it might be financial it might be comments on what you wear or how you behave that might evolve into the other and also might not exactly and so it's a really hard thing to write about and and your examination here isn't who should and shouldn't go to prison that's not what I mean it's almost like is this the stuff we just have to accept to some extent as part of especially hetero relationships and work through I think Mm. and work past I think one of the sort of inspirations for me wanting to write it in a way is that you know I am older and I work with lots of young women and I we I'm my work at Mama Mia means we're constantly involved in conversations about women and relationships and where we're going and what we're doing and what we want to change and what we don't and there is um, an eerie and sometimes quite depressing to be honest unshakable core that still seems to exist certainly as you say in hetero relationships which is this one about women are still finding themselves over and again put in positions that make them feel like nothing whether that's sexual or not and it's infuriating and I think that what you do about it is not simple but I'm happy that there's the language now about coercive control because not least because it is a red flag as you've addressed but it isn't always because that it's often it's often also a pattern of behavior for the guy involved who's like well I'm just trying to make her better I'm just trying to make our lives perfect I'm just trying to you know get what I want basically and don't we all want to get what we want so I really wanted to explore all of that without being too heavy-handed about it yeah and it, it absolutely achieved that and in that way I actually think that it will speak to more women because you recognize in, in, a, in a really horrific way, I think sometimes you recognise moments when perhaps you yourself have crossed the line with a partner and made them feel small in a way that maybe you didn't intend to or maybe you did. And that's, you know, it, it has a little bit to do with age. But I, the other thing I, I found really interesting that I wanted to ask you about in the book is the relationship between a woman in her 40s and a woman in her 20s. 
and that there is a little bit of, I don't want to call it tension, but there's a little bit of the 40-year-old going, oh, look at that naivety. Oh, my God, she reminds me of myself and therefore I'm sort of horrified. The 20-year-old is going, oh, my God, look at that lady, that old lady, whatever. Just what young people say. Like, what made you want to explore the dynamics between those two different generations? Well, it's uh, it's my life, a lot of it. <laughs> but I, I genuinely believe that um, I wanted to explore that idea of how they see each other. Mm. And how it's tricky as you get older and you do have all this life experience to not be the person who's always stepping in and going like, oh, darling, you know, you just need to break up with him or, you know, or not, you know, like stop being so picky or whatever it is. The stereotypes of what older women say to younger women make me uncomfortable, right? Because I think that you can't assume that journeys are the same and that times are the same and all those things. But then again, you do have a lot of wisdom and what are you meant to do with it, right? And then on the other hand, I wanted Laurie to be looking at this woman and being like, I wonder what she was like. Like, I wonder what she was like before children and responsibility and all these things got her down. And um, I mean, not that Mel is a tragic character. She's certainly not, although she is sort of spiraling at the moment that we meet her or about to spiral, Mm -hmm. at least at the moment we meet her. I find it really interesting, that dynamic. And, you know, personally in my own life, because I work with a lot of younger women, including yourself, and I love it. I love it. And I never feel um, a kind of patronizing pat on the head sense with any of the young women I work Mm. with. I feel like they're constantly pushing me, challenging me um, in good ways. But as I say, I find it depressing that we're still having these discussions about consent and um, abuse and you know after all these decades of feminism it's just depressing it's interesting (laughs) isn't it that once we leave a life stage we assume that the issues that went with it evaporated so as we've talked about it with even teenage girls you you get to I'm 31 and you know, you walk into work one day and go, oh, how lovely is it that men don't whistle at you on the street anymore? Yeah, and it's exactly. like, oh, men whistle. Oh, yes, they, they don't do. whistle at grown women. They whistle at girls in school uniforms. It's and so, so you true. think that the problem's gone and that this book is sort of looking at that, that it's it's like she thought that experience was very specific to her or that relationships have evolved when every woman at a life stage is almost faced yeah, with the same true. crises. I wanted to ask you a little bit about uh, the writing process because you are known for in your first chapters kind of setting something up and then going like boom in the last sort of paragraph of that first chapter. And it is such a cliffhanger you can't not get super into it. Did you know at the end of that first chapter how it was going to end? No, and I know that's not what you're supposed to say. I know it's not what you're supposed to say. I love beginnings. I love writing yeah, beginnings. I'm the same. And I actually really like writing ends too. It's the middle that's the really freaking hard part. Like there's yep. no question. You know, they call it the messy middle for a reason. Um, getting where you need to go. This book is much more tightly plotted than my last book um, in that because it has a sort of element of mystery. So, I mean, we've obviously been talking about its serious overtones, but hopefully it's also quite page turny in it and and a bit of a mystery to keep you going but I it was important where we revealed certain things Mm -hmm. and to be honest the reason I say I didn't know exactly is because I changed my mind quite a few times about where to make certain reveals obviously we don't want to do spoilers I won't say exactly what on mic but there are times where you know you think you might not know where Laurie is or what's happened to Laurie and then you find out and There were times when I thought that was going to be much further in the book, times when I thought it was going to be closer to me. I, this writing a plot driven book forced me to be much more organized and um, structured than usual, but I still am, I am a writer who changes my mind Mm. all the time when I'm writing. And that's true for the kind of writing that we do at Mamma Mia too, is I'll often write something and get halfway through it and be like, no, that's not it, you know? Mm. And so... I would love to be like Sally Hepworth, who we both know and is is a friend, um, gave me some really good structural advice just in terms of practical advice about how I laid my book out on Scrivener, right? Because I use Scrivener to write, lots of writers do. 
And she was like, she plots out every point, every chapter, exactly what's going to happen and has them all laid out on her scriven notes so that literally when she sits down, she's just opening that up and she's writing that thing. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to be exactly like Sally this time. It's going to be exactly like Sally. And of course, I just ended up like writing, rewriting, yeah. throwing the notes out, doing all those things because I am more of a, a fly by a seat of your pants kind of writer. But I want to get better and better at plot. Um, so... This was my most plot driven book, but I kind of that's like my ambition for the next book. And do you think in I remember speaking to um Jane Harper a while ago and I asked her if it gets easier because I think she's on her fourth fourth or fifth book. Yeah. Um and, and her I, plots are stellar. Her, exactly. And I said, Tell me it gets easier because the first first book, very hard. And she said, It does. It gets easier. Does it get easier? I don't... This wasn't easy. I'm not going to lie. Was this, it the hardest? This was very hard book to write and I think it was partly because of the circumstances. I think the last two years have been very hard, um, you know, mentally on us all in terms of all the uncertainty and stress that the pandemic brought. Hard to write anything cheerful. Mm. <laughs> I felt like I know so many writers who've been writing during this time whose publishers have been saying to them, um bit perkier maybe and they're like <laughs> not feeling real perky at the moment um but also I think my attention was really fractured I think so this wasn't a particularly easy book to write um I the thing that has changed is that I know I can do it so yeah um I think that I uh it's not necessarily that the process is any easier but I know I'll get there but I felt this this book was hard to write and I also felt the least um, clear about whether or not I thought it was good when I finished it, which is a weird thing to say. But like when I finished it, because it's quite complex and um, I mean, and it touches on lots of things. And I, I don't know, when I finished it, I was like, is that good? I don't know. So it's very good to hear. But I think maybe all writers are a bit like that. Yeah, they, they absolutely are. And I, I think that sometimes feeling that something is a mess at the end means you got somewhere Maybe. if you've if you've ended it with too many conclusions and you've tied everything up neatly in a bow then yeah I mean what mm. I mean nothing can be tied up like that the, I think we should talk about books before we go today Jessie. oh yes good idea I mean I know you're steering the ship um but this is the booktopia podcast okay tell me what books you've read actually like I want to know in the last year the best books you've read oh my god what are ones that come to mind? You spoke recently on the podcast about books you read when you were away. I did. On Mamma Mia Out Loud, we talked about the books I read and on holiday recently because I don't get to binge read as much as I'd like. I'm always very jealous of you for that because, mm -hmm. I mean, you're one of the busiest people I know. But when you're, when you're not flat out doing 25 things, you're very good at binge reading. You'll I try very hard to get into bed. I know it's better for my brain yeah. to read um, than, than to scroll. scroll through TikTok. Yep. So, but you yeah. will often say to me, I couldn't put it down. I read it in one sitting and I'm always like, oh, my God, I'm so jealous. That's what happens when you have children. I know. But <laughs> I um, I read Jacqueline Bublitz's book, um, Before You Knew My Name, in one sitting. I know you and I disagree a little bit about that book. Yep. But I really loved it and I did read it in one day, which was great when I was away. I also read the latest Anne Tyler book. I love her. But I think the books over the last year or more that I've loved reading, I actually... When I'm writing, I need to read books quite different to the one that I'm working on. So the fact that when I'd finished the book, I could then in my on my holiday, I binged on all these like female led, mm. slightly crimey books, because obviously I read Dirt Town, which is fabulous. We both loved that by Hayley Scrivener. Oh, brilliant. Um, I loved that. I read that just before I went away. And um, I loved that. And then I read Jacqueline Bublitz and I read... Uh, Girl A by Abigail Dean, which is great. But bef while I was actually writing, I have to read books that are very different. So I love, I mean, some of the books I've read, over the, I've loved over the last year are quite cliched ones like Hamnet by Maggie O'Farrell that I just adored. She's just written, actually, Maggie O'Farrell has a new book out now. She's a an amazing British journalist writer who wrote the most perfect book in Hamnet. She got really badly hit by COVID and she's been writing a lot about how it's, she couldn't even hold a pen and it took her imagination. So I'm really looking forward to reading her next one because God knows what that was like. And I know you finally read um, oh, Shuggy Bane. Loved it, loved it. Which is obviously not a particularly original suggestion. It did win the bloody Pulitzer or whatever it won. Booker? Booker. Booker. It won it's the one Booker. of those books that is, 
it, it's not a book, it's an experience. Yes. You, it is like a little life in terms of you just give <gasps> yourself to that book for a period of your life. But it's he's really got a good. new book out. I've heard that. Yep. Um, I did read Sally's latest one, The Soulmate, which I thought is one of her best. Me too. Um, but you've got some that are coming up. Tell, oh. Give us some book recommendations for p- books people are going to want to buy in the next couple of months. Look, it's a great thing about what we do and it's also a terrible thing because there is, I would say, nothing worse than reading a brilliant book, putting it down and going, I can't yell about it yet. I have to <laughs> wait. I've got all this energy. I want to give it to 100 people, but I have to wait until it's out. So Exiles by Jane Harper, one of her best. Yes. Absolutely. Everybody says. Yes. It is gasp jaw to the floor the twist is so 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 good I cannot wait for everyone to read this book it's brilliant so that's Exiles um the soulmate agree one of Mm. Sally's best uh loved it loved it it was one of those that I couldn't put down plotty great um have you read Seeing Other People by Diana Reed yet no (sighs) so she wrote Love and Virtue yes which you read right Yes. yes um I read that and go, you know when an author's younger than you? She's in her 20s. And she's so good. (laughs) And she wrote two books in five minutes. So this one's really good? Really good. Oh, wow. And it's, you know, those books, uh, sometimes I put like, there can be very, especially I find in the States, there are very plotty, it's really good, plotty books. And then there's quite literary books. And then there are some that manage to do both. Her writing is so observational it says things about how people speak and what they do when oh great 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 so so good and I actually just started Ghost Lover did you read that I've got it on my to be read pile which is Lisa Tadeo right yes her new one and um not into short stories I'm not a short stories person Mm. uh because it's a lot of energy to get into something and then you're like oh Oh. um Oh, really good. You have got to. It's really, really good. I think good. that's what's been deterring me from it on my pile is that it's short stories, mm. but sometimes a short story can be a perfectly formed little present. So Exactly. No, no, no. Really, really liked it. And I, I just think it's an exciting time to be watching Australian fiction. Yes. Australian fiction has never, ever been better. I read stuff from all over the world and I go, Aussies are the best writers in the world right now. Yes, so, we so are. So good. And of course you're writing yourself at the moment. I am. I am. Ha- I've been saying halfway for, <laughs> you know, six months. Um, I'm halfway through a novel. Are you on a word a day limit? What do you do? How do you, what's your process, Jessie Stevens? Uh, processes, haven't looked at it for three weeks. <laughs> yeah. busy, um, which is really good. But I actually love the, I love the times when you can just dream about it. Yeah, So because too. you can't, you can't write, but. You're constantly thinking about yeah. it. And also, nothing is as perfect as the oh. stuff you haven't written yet. In my <laughs> head, that book is just going really well. And then I sit down and look at the manuscript and I'm like, that's not what I thought it looked like because it felt very different. Um, but hopefully that will be out sometime next year, I hope. But it's that's why I love reading these Australian fiction books to just learn every time I'm like learning exactly what all the principles are. But... The couple upstairs. Ah. It is out in bookstores. It is, and obviously you can buy it right here on Booktopia. And actually, Mama Mia subscribers get ten percent off Booktopia. There's a beautiful synergy. Yes, between we love us. Booktopia. We do because you buy it and it just arrives at your house. Oh, turns up. And you went the other day, didn't you? I went to Booktopia. I have to say that was a bit of a moment for me because I didn't get to do that with a give my marriage year. It was COVID, and I probably wasn't popular enough to do it with the first two (laughs) so it felt like a moment in which I had achieved something when I went into the warehouse there with all the books and signed a lot of books and they were piled up tables and it was amazing it was really quite a thrill I kept annoying everyone there being like you have the dream job you can just go and pick up any book in this amazing warehouse it's heaven it's really good um it hurt my hand but I was very happy and maybe if you're listening to this you might get one of those signed ones yeah yeah Thank you for joining us, everyone. It's been so great to talk about The Couple Upstairs. It is, it's is—it's an outstanding book. Just trust us. Read it, read it, read it. Um, you will love it. Thank you, Jessie. Thank, uh, thank you for interviewing me. For everyone listening to this, order a copy of The Couple Upstairs by Holly Wainwright right now online from booktopia.com.au or at your local bookstore. If you enjoyed our show today, you can check out more episodes of Tell Me What to Read Right Now wherever you get your podcasts. Drop the show a review on Apple Podcasts or a like on Spotify and let us know what you think. 
Thanks for listening and just like us, never ever stop reading.